Hi, this is Amy Lewis with Cisco. We're here for Engineers Unplugged. I've got Chad Sackage and Vaughn Stewart. And are you guys ready? Always ready to rumble. Are you ready? I'm not ready to rumble, I'm ready to share. <laughs> are you ready? Let's go. All right, Amy, thank you so much. So, uh, Vaughn, you and I are here doing a bunch of sessions at VMworld. Uh, we've got uh, two, the, we've got one on storage best practices, and then we've got one on stretch clustering, right? Yes, absolutely, and so we thought it would be nice to share with everyone out there a little bit of the stretch, stretch clustering concept. It's, uh, I think, a technology or a construct that uh, many are well versed with or, or are considering, but maybe not so well versed with the details. So let's talk a little bit about this. Totally, so um, if I'm going to draw on this whiteboard, I think you're going to need to give me a boost. So, uh, so in, in all seriousness, this stretch clustering idea is, uh, is a cool one. It's been around actually for a while. Some some of uh, NetApp's customers were doing it back in the 3.5 and even in the 3.0 days, really in 3.5 days when NFS started to get used. Basically the idea here is that in any vSphere cluster you've got an N number of uh, vSphere ESXi hosts, right? And normally these are all located in one geographic location with a data store that they all access this way, either via VMFS or NFS. What people started to realize is, hey, if we use vMotion for non-disruptive workload mobility, and we're using VMHA for restart, what would happen if we distributed this cluster and we put it in two places? So what this introduces from a, an infrastructure perspective is the concept of stretching the vSphere cluster across two sites. Obviously we need to span our, our networking along with that as well as our storage. When it comes to, to the storage aspect and considerations, there tends to be two storage architectural models. Yeah. Both work very well. They have differences in idiosyncrasies that go a little bit beyond probably the time that we're going to have here, but we'll touch base on some of the, the core, core differences. So, in one of the architectural models, you can deploy what's called a stretched or a geo-stretched storage cluster, or as NetApp would refer to it as a metro cluster. And this means when I have my vSphere cluster spanned across two sites, I actually have two storage arrays, and they're replicating storage to one another. Basically, one is working in the format of a read-write copy or an active copy. The other is sitting here in a, in a standby or a read-only state, synchronously being mirrored. And what this allows us to do is allows us to have our, our virtual machines accessing the read-write copy. In the event of a vMotion, we execute a command on the storage platform. It switches this object to read-only, the remote copy to a read-write, and our data access continues non-disrupted to the virtual machines. We basically switching which side of the storage cluster has the active data services. That's one model. And another model, and we're talking about these things uh, in uh, the session that we're doing and all of the content's online. So if, if you dig it um, and you want to learn a little bit more, if you just go online at vmworld.com uh, or to your blog or my blog, which you can find us, just Google us, um, you can find the details. It's STO2982. So the other model here is uh, something that we, we refer to, we're trying to make it relatively generic as opposed to NetApp or EMC centric, uh, the idea of a distributed virtual active-active storage model. So in this case, what you have is you have some sort of scale-out cluster of storage on one side and some sort of scale-out storage model on the other side where um, they're presenting a single uh, volume that is uh, simultaneously active in both sides. Uh, and, and VMware uses a word, a set of words for this that are a little bit different than everybody else. They call the first category a uniform access mode, and then this other category a non-uniform access mode, but they both work great, right? In this case, what occurs is that the data is still being synchronously replicated between both sides, but the VMs can simultaneously write on either one of the sides. Again, each one of these solutions has differences that you need to build into your engineering design, working with your partners. Um, and, and both of them have one critical dependency, regardless of the storage model, to be able to do a vMotion from one place to another, you have to have layer two network adjacency. 
What that translates into is a MAC address needs to be able to disappear from one side and appear on the other side and not cause any sort of core networking issues, right? And so for that, at the networking layer up here, if you want to have layer two adjacency, there's really kind of three core ways to do it, right? So you hit the first one, I'll, I'll hit the other one. Sure. So the basic, uh, and, and probably the most uh, common yeah, form yeah. or general form of layer two adjacency is to span, is to span a VLAN and stretch the VLAN across both segments. This has been available, readily available in the Catalyst line for a long period of time, it's available in the Nexus line. While this is simple, easy, and readily available, there's a challenge with spanning layer two, which is, should I actually have a site failure, I have an issue, I have a potential issue for my routing tables. Yeah. And it can lead to conditions that some refer to as a trombone routing mechanism, which is, I have hosts that originally existed on site A, they've moved to site B, I've actually got a, a failure in site B, and I can't find my route I can't get route convergence on the layer two level over here in site B. In other words, the route that existed in A doesn't exist in B. So to address this challenge, there's been a set of net new technologies that are available, yep. uh, technologies that help encapsulate the abstraction of the, of the segments of the LANs and the MAC addresses so that we can actually now virtually or logically address the routing issues. These include um, OTV, OTV yep. which is overlay transport virtualization. Oh. And we're getting our signal here. Do you want to touch base on this briefly? Well, so just what I'd say is it's a, it's a feature that's uh, started on the Nexus 7K. Uh, it's now on the Nexus 5K as well. Um, it uh, simplifies the whole configuration because in essence you can take a layer two uh, you know, segment and, and, and stretch it across a layer three fabric. So simplifies things. And in conjunction with things like Lisp, and uh, Cisco did this crazy, uh, the gist of Lisp yeah. thing uh, at uh, VMworld. You can, you can check that out. Uh, if you want to learn more about how Lisp works, Lisp can work in conjunction with things like OTV and uh, things like uh, Fabric Path and other approaches to create, you know, stretched uh, and flat layer two networks and figure out the routing issues as well. So, from the storage side, you know, NetApp and EMC, we've got it covered. From the networking side, our friends at Cisco, a great partner of both companies, have got it covered. And and uh, definitely see the session. It's all on the vSphere Metro Stretch Cluster Support HCL listing too, which is great. So, thanks for joining us. Amy? All right, well that was a fantastic episode and we have one more challenge. The problem here is we only have one marker. So in the spirit of collaboration, it's unicorn time. As long time viewers know, we're going to see if you can draw a collaborative unicorn. Are you ready? Go, go, yes. <laughs> All right, we've got the back of the unicorn being drawn right now. <laughs> Good little curve, there you go. On the hoof, yeah, bring it. Oh, nice, nice form of the leg. Don't forget your tail there. I want a nice rainbow tail. There you go. There you go. I like nice. All right, give me the next back. There you go. Nice chest. We've got the handoff. Go. Handoff. All right, go, go, Vaughn. You can do it, man. You can do it. That's a long neck. You, you have a long neck. That's a. Oh, yeah. Oh my God, this is going horribly awry. <laughs> That's a great horse's ass, but this is. Oh man. Oh, <laughs> it's turned into a mute. This is terrible. <laughs> and listen. Uh, oh. The defining element of the unicorn. Here we have it, folks. By the way, the origin of the unicorn myth are narwhal uh, uh, horns. Fascinating thing. You can look it up online. And you know what? Since we're all about victory, underneath the rainbow, there's always a pot of gold. How you like that? That is, hands down, the best unicorn we've had. I, I'm, I'm going to bias the vote. So. I want you viewers to, to tell us what you think. This is collaboration at work. Thank you both think, so much. I, I think Chad's right. The ass is much better than the. <laughs> <laughs> okay, viewers, you can decide if you heads or tails. Um, that's <laughs> vote, vote at hashtag engineersunplugged, engineersunplugged.com. Uh, we'll see you next time. <laughs>